Good afternoon. I'm Martha Gilmer, CEO of the San Diego Symphony Orchestra, and we're so excited to come back to you today to talk about our renovations of Jacobs Music Center. Um, we are making such incredible progress. Every time I walk in, it's more exciting, and we really want to share that with you today. It's a little hard to take a construction walk when there's so much work going on, so we want to take you inside and let you know what to expect. Um, I'm joined today by Jim Moore of HGA, our architects, our Vice President of Impact and Innovation, Laura Reynolds, our Vice President for Venue Operations, Travis Weinecker, and our Director of Artistic Planning, AJ Benson. They're going to join with me in discussion of this new space and how um, we all will interact with it and what our plans are for really activating it. Um, and so let's start with, uh, let's start with you, Jim. Um, can you take us through some of the mo most visual changes within the hall? What, uh, so anticipating what people can expect, because I know a lot of you are starting to look at your brochures and starting to imagine where you're going to be sitting and what's the whole new experience going to be like. So Jim, focus on, you know, also our ADA um, ac accommodations and new sight lines, et cetera. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Martha, and thanks everyone for, for having us today. You know, accessibility is one of the features and topics that we're most excited and proud to talk to you about. Um, we, uh, we think of accessibility not from a physical standpoint, but also focusing on visual and oral accessibility and really working in um, from a prompt, Martha, from you, where you charged us with making this hall safe and truly inclusive environment for everyone to enjoy the, equally the performances and all the amenities. I think from the public stand, standpoint or point of view, two of the areas that um, you'll notice the biggest changes from, a, from an accessibility standpoint, um, one being the Seventh Avenue lobbies. For those of you who might remember those lobby, that lobby before the renovation, there was lots of steps um, and very steep ramps and where we could, we've taken away those steps and lengthened the ramps, widened the ramps, introduced railings um, uh, um, in places where needed for just a, um, a little bit more um, uh, um, security in, in making those transitions. And then as we move into the hall, um, you'll notice that we've doubled the amount of accessible seating positions in the hall. And really equity was one of the drivers of our design here. Um, on the orchestra level, those might remember before the, uh, before the renovation, there was this large expanse of seating. And we've broken up that seating um, and embraced the stage in this kind of arc of seating and introduced a cross aisle. One of those things that cross aisle does introduced in, in addition to making the circulation easier throughout the hall has allowed us to provide more accessible seating positions deeper into the onto the floor and to make those some of the best seats uh, on the floor level. That cross aisle um, is also the same level of the stage. So for those events that need it, one can walk from the cross aisle onto stage um, without uh, traversing any, any steps or stairs. So again, um, all of the seats, um, with all the acoustic moves that we've made in the hall, all of the seats will experience a much fuller uh, sense of intimacy and envelopment. Um, so from every, every sense, um, uh, the hall is, is more accessible. Jim, can you talk to me also, or to all of us about railings and railings as you're um, navigating the stairs in the, especially? Absolutely. So. Handrails is something that um, we've included everywhere in the hall where there's a, a transition in floor level. So along ramps, um, there are handrails and along each step, whether you're um, walking up the balcony to your seat um, or, uh, or walking down uh, any aisle that changes floor level. And then there's a different kind of rail called a guard rail that prevents um, that uh, just keeps you walking on path um, where there are substantial changes in elevation, and those are um, and those are typically much higher. They're about 42 inches, unless 
unless they are um, somewhere where you might need to see over for sight lines, and then they're a little bit lower than that. I think I think I heard the number fifty two different elevations in the hall. <laughs> that's that's true. This building was designed at a time where um, steps were in vogue to introduce. Um, uh, trans physical transitions and make you aware of that you're entering into an important space. And I think these days we found um, many other more elegant ways to, um, to accomplish that. So we've tried to simplify um, all of those levels to make your passage. We really tried to think of this comprehensively for the users, whether you're walking throughout the hall or you're approaching the, the box office or service counters and making those making those areas as welcoming um, and universally accessible as possible. I know myself having many times walked up and down that steep ramp in the center of the Grand Tier. Um, that is now gone and is replaced by stairs, but the ramps on either side, uh, left and right, north and south, are longer and less less steep, is that right? That's right. Those ramps on the sides also um, ran right through the sound and light lock doorways. So what we've done with those ramps is we've lengthened those, we've introduced landings in front of doors so um, patrons can walk through very, uh, very safely and easily um, and make their way up to the, to the balcony. We talk ourselves about sound and light locks and I was on a tour with somebody saying, what is a sound and light lock? Do you want to describe that in uh, in terms that a patron will re readily recognize? Sure. They, these are vestibules um, with two sets of doors. And the two sets of doors act in unison to trap sound or light so that when someone enters or exits the hall during a performance, that sound or light from within the lobby doesn't disturb the performance. And it's something... Uh, it's a feature that we've added to the hall to help with the sound isolation between the hall and the lobby. Music is best performed on silence, and we're really trying to get the hall to be a lot quieter. You've already heard that we've moved the HVAC system out of the hall itself, hanging above the roof. Um, and all of these will make the listening experience that more intense. Sometimes I think we were not even aware, unless you just sat in the quiet hall and listened at how much white noise or background noise there was. And that's really going to change dramatically. Um, angel wings, we've, we know the angel wings because we've seen choruses up there where they're just beautiful architectural um, points within the hall and occasionally an offstage trumpet or trumpets or brass members would find their way, but now they're going to be another area that the audience can enter. That's right. These are really um, fun balcony uh, opportunities that we've introduced. There are three on each side, and um, uh, we really feel that they, they're allowing a perspective that one has never had in the hall before to sit and um, uh, not only enjoy the performance, but get a feeling of community and, and um, feel the excitement of the audience enjoying the performance as well. And I personally have stood on the new platforms on left and right of the Grand Tier. Those were areas that had steep stairs and they kind of turned around. They were not favorite walkways of my, my own. Um, and now those are flat ramps that can be, that are ADA compliant and have access from those uh, other ramps that we were just talking about. So those are two other exciting areas to sit in. Absolutely. So, Travis, why don't we turn our attention to um, the backstage and basement area for our musicians? How is that more commodious to them? And then anything you wanna add in terms of our audience experience? Absolutely. In addition to improving accessibility, so to speak, for our audience members, we've improved the, the situation for our musicians and crew backstage as well. Um, one of the, the key new features will be a new stage door, a new artist entrance uh, that will be at the top side of 8th Avenue, um, which will um, directly access an elevator that serves all of the new spaces on stage right. So um, some 
People may remember from the earlier discussions that we've had, we're adding actually six floors um, over uh, the stage right wings and the, between the existing buildings of um, library space, office space, the Coral Terrace, uh, et cetera. One of those levels will be a brand new artist entrance. And um, they'll be able to come straight down that new passenger elevator um, to uh, stage level, to their uh, musician's lounge uh, below stage, um, or any of the other various levels. Uh, before the introduction of this new stage door, um, they had a very steep catwalk stair uh, that served as the stage door entrance. And if someone had an, a, a mobility issue, um, the only way down to the stage was via the service elevator um, backstage. So that just wasn't a very graceful way for um, our artists to, to enter the buildings. Um, in addition to uh, that, on, on stage, we're introducing a new, what we're calling the, the maestro door, <laughs> um, which will be a, a downstage door right on the edge of the the apron uh the downstage edge of the stage and um that will allow um people to walk along the edge of the stage without having to find their way through the orchestra whether that's the the conductor or whether it's a soloist um, they won't have to take that precarious path down the, the risers any longer they'll, they'll have a nice uh flat access to uh the front of the stage as well so the risers, you mentioned risers. We have brand new riser system coming in. Can you talk a little bit about what that's going to look like? I can, yes. This is something um, that I know our musicians are very excited about. Um, by um, making some um, updates uh, around the, the stage to our fire curtain, our smoke evacuation system and uh, other things, we're able now to have the musicians risers wrap in a semicircle all the way around the stage and really um, hug the edges of the, the stage for the orchestra. So now, um, you know, the majority of our strings, um, our woodwinds and beyond will be able to be up on risers, which will create a much better sight line for them to the conductor, but also will also allow our audience members to have a better view of the orchestra as well. Um, and with the introduction of our choral terrace, um, it steps down toward the stage as the risers come up. So it'll be a really great relationship between um, those chorus members or even for audience seated in those seats um, to have great sight lines from there as well. To me, there's a kind of symmetry when you will stand on the orchestra risers, which are curved, and you look mm -hmm. out at the audience and the relationship to the parterre is roughly the same levels where that's also a curved surface. So it's it's kind yeah. of... A, an unformed or broken two half circles that in that are are placed between the stage and the main floor. Absolutely, and I know Jim has described uh, before. We have you know the beautiful proscenium arch, which now is open to the full height of of that arch we, by removing the valance that used to be there, and um, it. It also, if you were to lay it down in the hall, um, it almost perfectly aligns with the the new the uh, shaping of the seating in the, on the orchestra level and that new parterre, um, the, the shape of that cross aisle. So um, it really all works together really beautifully. It's very, very balanced, which is a term we really strive for in music making as well. So um, you mentioned the choral terrace. Uh, it will be used two or three or four times a year by choruses singing with the orchestra. But when it's not being utilized by chorus, how can one access it, it, it as an audience member? Great question. Um, that will be from the grand tier level of seating. Um, so from the upper lobby level uh, and the, the grand tier, um, the side aisles would continue. And um, Jim, maybe I'll let you describe the, the pathway and some of the improvements along that pathway that audiences will experience. Sure. Well, this is really a fun addition because um, we're inspired by a few really special visual moments that were in the hall. These, um, the organ screens and some openings in those organ screens. And by extending these passages, we're now able to walk behind those organ screens and peek out into the hall again and get a, a unique view that users never had before. 
And just after they do that, they'll um, find a stairway that will work its way down onto the level of the coral terrace and be able to um, access the coral terrace at that point. It's really kind of a fun journey um, and unique journey that um, to a unique experience that um, uh, that patrons have never seen before this really intimate relationship with the musicians where they can really get a close up view of, of them playing and interacting on stage. Travis, before we leave you and talk more about the Coral Terrace and programming, can you talk a little bit about the newly renovated downstairs spaces for our musicians, the dressing rooms and practice rooms and I will, absolutely. And before I do that, I just want to mention that the Coral Terrace will be ADA accessible as well. So for audience members right. who have a desire to sit in the Coral Terrace, um, that, that is a possibility also. Um, we have a whole new suite of musician spaces below the stage uh, for our orchestra members. Um, they'll have a nice new um, lounge, uh, open lounge with uh, banquettes and tables seating around uh, with a kitchen so that they have a space to prepare their lunches during rehearsals and, and things like that. Um, there will be uh, new locker rooms uh, for uh, the musicians with uh, ensuite restrooms. Uh, before their restrooms were located across the hall from their locker rooms, which was not an ideal situation. Uh, so it's great to have those contiguous spaces now. And um, probably the thing that they're most excited about is the addition of a whole suite of practice rooms, uh, which we, we only had a couple of very small uh, practice rooms like you would see in a conservatory uh, si situation before, nothing like the scale that we'll have now. We'll have um, several very generously sized rooms. And the way that we were able to get that was by moving all of that mechanical equipment that we've talked about before that used to be in the basement now up above our roof suspended from the parking structure. So that opened up a whole hallway that we were able to add a new suite of uh, practice rooms that can double as dressing rooms as well when needed for larger works. It's very exciting to walk down there for sure. Um, AJ Benson has joined us just, I don't know what, six months, seven months, something like uh, that. Just under, yeah. As director of artistic uh, planning, and a lot of this obviously was planned before your arrival. But as you've put together with Rafael Payari, as you put together next season, and as you imagine how to activate these spaces, of course, the magic is when we get to hear the hall for the first time, when most of the acoustic um, support is in. We haven't uh, we haven't approached that yet. Um, but what are you thinking when you look at that coral terrace or when you look at the parterre and the main seat? How does that excite you about how we can um, in, enhance and enlarge our programming? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And I think about the old adage, uh, when you talk about not knowing yet what's coming up, we don't know what we don't yet know. <laughs> We're going to find out. But the, the proposition of having a permanent shell um, in, a, in a space that is as you know visually arresting and gorgeous with a real keen eye towards uh, trying to capture um, all of this wonderful detail that was historic in its in its scope. It's pretty remarkable. Um, I think Raphael's mind turned to one of the most, um, I guess, pivotal and kind of poetic expressions of this in a work that we're opening the subscription season, uh, dealing with renewal, with resurrection, so Mahler's second symphony. And at the end of that work, it incorporates uh, a mass choir of incredible voices. And this is so appropriate for a moment in which we'll see the new choral terrace in use and in effect. Um, and I think, you know, that's that's kind of guiding uh, the imagination at this point. Um, one of the other elements of thinking of its use is for the audience. And we've talked a lot about the fact that now uh, through subscription options, through ticket sales, uh, audience members will be able to sit behind the orchestra. And anyone who's gone to, you know, other major venues across the world, even in California, um, knows the feeling of being able to sit kind of suspended above the group. It's a different aural experience, of course, but there is also, um, as Jim had, had pointed out before, this element of being able to see the interactivity between musicians, 
kind of the interplay, the unspoken communication that can be so, I think, uh, I guess, not only entertaining, but moving and meaningful. Um, we're talking a little bit about chamber music in the venue. The fact that uh, the front orchestra section kind of now stands alone uh, with a cross aisle behind it, plus the use of the choral terrace as potentially audience seating. So you could, in essence, imagine a space for chamber music in the round um, and other recital approaches. So these are just a little bit of the, the thinking that we have at this point. I think there's a chance also that activating those angel walks and activating other parts of the hall just kind of calls out for um, spatial programming. and. Yeah, I, I think a lot about, um, for instance, a, a concerto for three violins in Echo uh, by Antonio Vivaldi, where you have them placed throughout the hall and they all kind of answer each other and the main soloist on stage. I think that's a particular work that would be really, really um, effective in the space. We're talking about, of course, the use of um, the Julia balconies, for instance, for um, dramatic effect, um, and the Angel Walk, of course, for brass as well. I mean, fanfares lend themselves very, very naturally to that space. It's really going to be fun to start to play with that once we are fully in the hall. Um, I want to welcome Laura. Laura is our Vice President for Impact and Innovation, and speaking of imagining new ways to use the hall. But it isn't just the concert hall itself. We also have additional spaces throughout the building, and, and importantly, a new, what we're currently calling multi-purpose room, uh, just off the main lobby. So Laura, tell us what you imagine happening. Yeah, so again, so many exciting changes happening inside the venue, but also really thinking about all of our lobby spaces and we have an upper lounge as well as a multi-purpose space. And so um, AJ and I and many others are starting to imagine how we activate those spaces. And of course, music is something that comes to mind. And part of my role is thinking about um, the ways that we enhance the experiences that are happening on stage for our audiences. And so um, if I think about something like our family concerts, as an example, I think about that time before and after a concert where families can make those memories together and start building those musical relationships. So um, our lobbies, I'm anticipating, will be full of different um, sorts of musical activities, whether that's composition activities or building instruments or hearing a local youth um, chamber ensemble perform. Um, those are all different ways that I imagine these lobby spaces being filled with sound and filled with families engaging and deepening their experience to what they're going to hear on this beautiful stage. Um, but this multi-purpose space is very exciting. It is really, really incredible that we have carved out this space within our venue. Um, you know, we were hearing a little bit about sound and light locks, and that's really important for this space because it's right next to our control room, um, which means that this is a space that we can use for all sorts of different activities, including recording chamber music. Um, we can use this space for different uh, audiovisual installations. So imagine walking into a space and immersing yourself in the story of the music ahead of a concert or during intermission. Um, it's got flexible audiovisual, flexible seating, has capacity for about I don't know, 60 to 70 people, depending on how we set up that seating. And I really imagine that being a space where we can experiment and play and really, um, again, whether that's a panel conversation or an installation or a small chamber ensemble performance, being a place where we can make those deeper connections and deeper memories with the, the music that we're hearing all around us in the concert hall. It's, it's really exciting. And I, I know we want to activate our lobby as people arrive on the, on B, on the B Street side of things um, as well, just kind of making it more welcoming from the time you walk in the door, knowing you're walking into a really exciting place. Um, so I really want to invite questions for any member of the team here. And if anybody thinks we skipped over a subject, please, jot it down and we'll come back to it. But I have one question. 
which I get all the time. And I, the very dramatic um, way to interact on our website to look at your, the seat you've had or a seat you're considering. Um, but the question is, what is the new best seat in the house? Um, and the answer, of course, you would expect is every seat is a good seat. Uh, and I think more, more than ever, that is true. Uh, the sight lines to the stage have, are so improved on the main floor. The sight lines upstairs were always very good. But there's a, because of this parterre and because of the curvature of the seats and the fact that the walls have been brought in and the back forward, there is already a feeling of great um, interconnection between audience and stage. And Raphael has stood on the stage and some members of the orchestra, and they can't believe how close the back wall is now. There are much less seats, rows of seats under the overhang. And there's just a, I, I know there's going to be a feeling of connection with the new seating configuration. Um, some of you who sat on the main floor or have, have seats on the main floor historically, yes, there's an aisle through some of those seats now, or if they were on the side or at the back, they don't exist. But you can go on our website and somebody else will, will help me um, in terms of the link. But you can go on our website and you can actually interact and, and move in a kind of um, great animation to see the view from your seat or other seats and the connection to the stage. Thank you, HGA, for making that possible. It's, it's a very exciting feature. We were actually, we were all playing with it before we logged on today and it was fascinating to do. Um, where will the pre-concert talks take place? Laura, that's over to you. And that's a, that's a big question when we don't quite yet know what the, what the hall, uh, how the hall functions, but take it away. Yeah, we're still working on that. Um, I imagine that we'll continue to be seeing the pre-concert talks on stage prior to a concert. Um, it's a great, you know, people can come in and early for their concert experience, learn a little bit more, take a deep dive into the repertoire that they'll hear that evening um, and, you know, maybe get comfortable in their seat uh, prior to the concert. Uh, we usually have somewhere between, you know, around 100 people attend these talks. So it's a little bit bigger of an audience than our multi-purpose room has capacity for. So I imagine that those talks will continue to take place on stage in the hall. So here's another one. What is the best and easiest way to access the grand tier? I can take that one. Perfect. Uh, the the best path will be from the grand tier uh, level, so from the upper lobby level, and there'll be hallways left and right that will lead to a, a stair, one flight of stairs that would take you down to the Coral Terrace from that level. Um, just to sort of explain the relationship, the Coral Terrace actually sits between the lower lobby level and the upper lobby level. Um, so it's right between the, the two, but the access for audience members would be from the grand tier. There, and then there will be an elevator accessible um, on the house right, uh, stage left side of the venue for anyone that needs elevator access to that terrace. Can anyone take a tour of these new backstage spaces once they're complete? Travis, again to you. Sure, um, absolutely. Uh, we'll have an opportunity and we absolutely intend um, as we did, uh, you know, pre-COVID before the, the venue closed. Um, at that point, we did monthly tours. We absolutely um, will keep that up and probably at a higher frequency when we first open, because we know that there will be uh, demand for people that want to see the venue. But even ongoing, at least monthly, we plan to continue that. And AJ, following up on that, AJ and Laura, you want to talk about how we're opening the season in terms of the first concert and then on that Sunday, the what you have planned, Laura? Sure. AJ, do you want to start with um, our opening night? Yeah. So November 4th is our planned gala. Um, and we're opening with a, potentially a fanfare by a local composer, Teksu Kim. So we'll get a sense of kind of the sonic bloom of the space. And Raphael intended with this program uh, to kind of showcase all a variety of different colors of the orchestra. So audiences can expect to hear um, just a panoply 
of approaches to stylistic composition, uh, a range of soloists. We have a vocal soloist on the program singing Mozart. Uh, we have a saxophone soloist playing a new work by Billy Childs. Um, we'll include a Strauss tone poem on that program. And then they'll also get to hear uh, WC, uh, WC's Le Maire. Um, this really lush, gorgeous work that will really bloom in the space. And that's kind of the, the very first moment we step in on kind of an official uh, point of view. And I know, Laura, we have a lot of other things that we're working through over that entire weekend. Yeah, we're cooking up some some fun things that you'll have to stay tuned for because we're not ready to announce that yet. But Sunday, um, so there's this fabulous opening night on Saturday. And then Sunday, we welcome our family audiences into the hall for the first time. And it, it, we're opening with um, this beautiful work um, by Jesse Montgomery and Mo Willems called Because, a Symphony of Serendipity. Um, and we'll also hear... Uh, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, uh, Marquez's Congo de Fuego, and there'll be some really fun audience interactive moments. So um, it'll be something really that I think everyone in the family will enjoy. And all of those things that I talked about earlier about activating that lobby um, are things that you'll experience when you come to our family concert. So I'm really, really proud of the fact that we're opening the hall with all of these different audiences in mind. And that is a very important part of our goal. Um, it it is uh, our intent that this hall has existed for you know almost a hundred years. The renovation of the hall is not reflective of our history. It is planning for our future and for the future audiences. And so, a lot of the performances we have, it's really looking forward with young artists and um, some of our first audiences are going to be students, uh, and always will, they will be welcome. But it's really laying this groundwork um, into the future. Um, I see one more question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, and that is, will these extra new spaces, new multi-purpose spaces also be available for rentals? And the answer is yes, we will have a robust rental program. We want to make this available to our community and to other arts partners. So um, that coming soon, I would say, uh, once we kind of get the schedule figured out. So, um, Thank you for joining us today. We couldn't be more excited, as you know. Um, we're happy to show, share some of this Jacobs Music Center series videos with you on a regular basis. And as you know, our subscriptions are on sale for the 23-24 uh, Jacobs Music Center season. You can go to the website, www.sandiegosymphony.org. I hope you're as excited as we are. We love giving you these kind of sneak peeks into the future and we're counting down the days um, until we can welcome everyone back here to the home of the San Diego Symphony indoors. Thanks for being with us today and thanks for all you do to support us.